Hey everybody, happy First Fruits from Nashville, Tennessee. It's great to be with you today. We're really excited about all that's going on in the world, but especially here in Nashville and Middle Tennessee and Oklahoma and some of these key places around the world that we hear from where God's Spirit is just pouring out like never before. This really is the most exciting time to be alive and I'm so glad to be with you today to share a little bit about First Fruits, what it means to us here as a congregation, what it means to, to me personally. Um, I'm the pastor at our congregation here, uh, been a lifelong Messianic believer, uh, started when I was a small child, and since then it, it's been interesting seeing how it's grown over the years and sort of the maturation of the movement and just the outpouring of the Holy Spirit throughout. I think we're seeing more and more fruit every single day, and it's just absolutely amazing that we're at this time, at this season, to start a new year of feast cycles. Um, starting with these spring feasts, and that's what we're here to talk about today. So I hope that you will uh, really just lean into these feasts. Um, these are absolutely extraordinary appointments. These are times that God said that he wants his people to come together and to be with him. Um, and so we have to make sure that we're operating on both of those levels. So today I want to talk a little bit about First Fruits itself. Um, it's, I think, intentional by the Father that first fruits happens to be among the first holidays that we celebrate every year because it really does set the stage for everything that's to come. Uh, and it, it's a concept that I think we, we see throughout Scripture, but oftentimes it's hard to connect the dots. It's kind of an abstract thing. You know, we sing a lot of songs and there's po poetry and psalms and other things about first fruits, but like what is first fruits? What does that even mean? And especially for those of us now, you know, we're several thousand years removed from when these scriptures were written. What does this mean for us today as believers who are trying to pursue the things of the Father? So I think one of the key verses that always comes to my mind when I think about first fruits is in Proverbs 3. And if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to read along. If you're, if you're a note taker, I'd strongly encourage you to take notes. It is a lost art that we need to bring back the, the ability to study and to remember and meditate on these things. There's so much information in the world we really need to just push forward and be super intentional about the training and the discipleship of our faith. So Proverbs 3, in verse 5, it says, Trust in the Lord, trust in Yahweh with all of your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Honor Yahweh with your wealth, with your first fruits of your crops. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. And I think for those of us as believers, we read those verses about new wine and it, it's so much more meaningful than perhaps even at the time when these Psalms were written. But um, that's what we're pursuing today. All of this stuff, it talks about how we're supposed to honor Yahweh with our wealth, with the first fruits of our crops. And it is... Uh, it's a trend we see throughout Scripture, starting in the Torah and extending throughout all the way to Revelation. But there is this promise that Yahweh gives his people that if we do what he says to do, if we live life the way that he covenanted with us for us to live, if he is our Lord, he will provide. And the promise here is that there will be this first fruits of our crops. There will be wine vats overflowing. There will be barns filled with plenty. You're going to be prosperous in all things. And I think in the Christian world, for so many years, we've got twisted. Um, and a lot of people have rightfully criticized the prosperity gospel message because it is not the gospel. It's not necessarily our salvation or our belief in Yeshua that causes prosperity. But throughout Scripture, there is a promise that if we are obedient to God, we will be rewarded with the best possible life here on earth. And that does include prosperity in all things. So here we sit. 2,000 years, you know, from when the Messiah walked the earth. And we have these feasts. We have this feast of first fruits. Uh, it, it's so important for us to understand what this means to us. And yes, it is a holiday that we celebrate, but it's a concept that should be in every aspect of our lives. And that's what I hope that we'll understand today. So in Nehemiah 10, verse 35. It says, we also assume responsibility for bringing to the house of the Lord each year the first fruits of our crops and of every fruit tree. So in these, these verses, I should just interrupt for a minute. These are all things that, especially for people who are 
well Christianized in our faith and our upbringing, we understand the verses about tithing. These are things that are spoken to us all the time. And I think to a certain extent, we've probably gotten burnt out on them because of the abuses that we've seen. But just the spirit of generosity is so important. And first fruits is another moment when Yahweh calls for us to be generous. So we're supposed to bring our first fruits to the Lord. Verse 36, I'll pick it up. It says, as it is also written in the law or in the Torah, we will bring the firstborn of our sons and our cattle of our herds and of our flocks to the house of the Lord, to the priests ministering there. Moreover, we will bring to the storerooms of the house of our God, to the priests, the first of our ground meal, of our grain offerings, of the fruit of all, all of our trees, and of all of our new wine and olive oil. And we will bring a tithe of our crops to the Levites, for it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all the towns where we work. A priest descended from Aaron to accompany the Levites when they received the tithes. And the Levites also are to bring a tenth of the tithes up to the house of God, to the storeroom of his treasury. The people of Israel, including the Levites, are to bring their contributions of grain, new wine, and olive oil to their storerooms, where the articles of the sanctuary and for the ministering priests and the gatekeepers and the musicians are also kept. We will not neglect the house of our God. That's so important, that concept of us having stewardship and ownership over the house of God. As believers, we are all called to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That was Yahweh's intent before the golden calf debacle, before the priesthood was implemented, before the tabernacle was set up. Those things were done as uh, a second best solution to a corrupted situation following the golden calf. Prior to that, at Mount Sinai, Yahweh wanted to dwell face to face with his people. He wanted every single man, woman, and child to operate as a priest unto him. And as priests, that means that we, each and every one of us, are called to minister to Yahweh and to minister to one another. That is the calling of every believer at every moment in this life. And one of the ways that we've been talking about and how we do this, and this really is the central functioning point of the Feast of First Fruits was it was this time of outrageous generosity. It was a time when God expected for his people to bring their very best and their very first to him. In these passages, like we just read, oftentimes first fruits gets lumped in with tithing, it gets lumped in with offerings, it gets lumped in with a lot of other acts that God has given to us. Um, but these are distinct things. I think it's important for us to break them down and understand what a tithe is, what an offering is, what a sacrifice is, what a first fruits giving is. All of these sorts of things have a time and a purpose and they send a spiritual message with them. It's also really, really important. This is something that struck me for years and I think it's oftentimes lost, um, particularly maybe in our movement because we don't have as much infrastructure and things are a little more out of sight, out of mind. But we have to understand that in Scripture, there is a divine pattern that Yahweh lays out. And it goes all the way back to the building of the tabernacle. It happened at the exodus from Egypt when the Egyptians basically gave everything they could to get the Israelites out of their land as fast as possible. Um, it happened in the second chapter of Acts, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They were in the temple when that happened. And in order to enter the temple, you have to enter with an offering. Um, but throughout scripture, the birth of Yeshua, what happens at the birth of Yeshua? We read the story of the wise men. And in all of these moments, the, the most incredible moments of our faith, there is a moment of outrageous generosity on behalf of God's people. Even at the resurrection, the women were coming there to give an offering, to anoint the body of our Messiah when they discovered his resurrection. And so in all of these things, there are these, these moments where God's people step forward in outrageous generosity. And those are the times when throughout scripture, we see the spirit of God poured out like never before. Those are the moments of salvation and redemption and restoration for God's people. And the interesting thing about it is most of those moments of outrageous giving, like the contribution for the tabernacle, where they gave so much that they had to tell everybody to stop giving because there was too much gold being offered. But those were not commanded offerings. Those were just the outpouring of the love and the generosity of God's people 
So yes, there were tithes. Yes, there were commanded offerings and sacrifices. And yes, there were even things like first fruits that were commanded to give. But above and beyond all of that was just this outrageous giving of God's people to one another, as we see all throughout the book of Acts, but then also to God. And I think for us as believers, if we are expecting an outpouring, if we are expecting a big move of God in this time, in this day and age, our part to that, our response to that, our preparation for that should be an attitude of outrageous giving where we surrender all that we have. We give all of our resources to the Lord and to his kingdom. We hold nothing back. And first fruits is the first example of that, that we see in the feast cycle. But with all of these things, you do get this concept of tithing. And I know you mentioned that money. You start talking about people's money and everybody gets all tight and anxious. But scripture says that our hearts and our treasures are intertwined. Um, and I really believe that your, your bank accounts, your statements, they are your mission statement. Um, it reveals your heart. It reveals the things that you have interest in. It reveals the things that you want more of in this world. Those are the things we put our money toward. Those are the things we put our treasure toward. But all of these things are not necessarily Christian things. These aren't things we inherited from the Catholic Church. These aren't things we inherited even from the second chapter of Acts. They aren't even necessarily even Torah things. These go back even further from when the Torah was written. All of these things, tithes, offerings, first fruits, these were tributes in the ancient Near East that people gave to kings and to their God. One of the first examples we have of tithing was before there was ever a priesthood, before there was a tabernacle, Abraham tithed. Then we read later that Jacob tithed, and Jacob really gives us the explanation of why he would do this tithe. Um, after he experiences God, he makes a, a vow or covenant to God, uh, essentially his salvation statement. And he says that if Yahweh will protect and provide for him on his journey, and if Yahweh will bring him back safely, that Yahweh would be his God and that he would then tithe, 10% of all that he has to the Lord. Um, in the ancient Near East, the idea of tithing and offerings and first fruits, these were tributes that you paid to a king. And so when Jacob, when Abraham, when these people tithed, when they gave, when they made offerings to the Lord, it wasn't just a church tax. It wasn't just a formality that they went through every Sunday where they wrote a check. It wasn't just something they did every Shabbat where they put money in a box. It was a, a statement that they were aligning their citizenship. In Abraham's case, he was aligning it to Jerusalem. In Jacob's case, he was aligning his citizenship to Yahweh. And his agreement is the same agreement that we all have when we say that Yeshua is our Lord. His obligation, if we are his servants, is that he will protect and provide for us. He will preserve us as a good king should. And that's what all this giving and stuff that we read about in the Bible is all about. And that's just tithing. First fruits goes even deeper. And people don't really talk a whole lot about first fruits. Um, it's not one of the most common uh, giving verses you hear in your Sunday churches. It's not something that even in the uh, Hebraic or Torah-minded communities that we talk about a whole lot aside from the holiday. But it is a concept that exists throughout Scripture. And it is that idea of a tribute owned to a god or to a king, to someone who is sovereign and in control over your life. And one of the first places we see it um, is, goes all the way back to the very beginning in Genesis 4. Um, this is describing the family of Adam and Eve. We've got Cain and Abel, these two brothers. You know how this story is going to end. But in the meantime, there's some key language that we should focus on. Um, in, verse, in chapter 4, verse 2 of Genesis, it says that she, Eve, his mother, gave birth to, a to his brother Abel, and Abel kept the flocks, and Cain worked the soil. And in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. So that's a good thing. He's giving the fruits that he has as an offering to the Lord. So there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But in verse 4, it says, And Abel also brought an offering. 
And these are the key words. It talks about the fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was angry and his face was downcast. There we see the first example in scripture of a first fruits type offering. And really all of the offerings that are to be given to the Lord are to be the very best. They are to be your firstborn. They are to be, it says, the fat portions or the healthiest of the animals here. Um, and really, those are the only distinctions that we see between the offering that Cain gave and the offering that Abel gave. They both gave what they had. Um, the only real descriptors between the two is that Abel offered the fat portions and he offered the firstborn of his flock. He essentially offered the first fruits of his flock to the Lord. Whereas Cain, that description is not there. So Cain apparently just gave whatever he had. Um, it wasn't necessarily his best. And that, of course, set in motion a chain of events that we are still reaping the ramifications of today. But this idea of bringing your first fruits, and really first fruits, let's not get it twisted, it's not just fruit. It's the first of whatever you have. In scripture, as we read, it talks about bringing your first son and dedicating him to the Lord. We know even Yeshua, that happened in his life when his parents brought him to the temple. Um, we're supposed to redeem the first of our cattle, the first of our crops, the first oil. Essentially, any time that there was an increase in your life, God's people, as subjects in his kingdom, were commanded to give their first and their very best of their very first to Yahweh. Later in scripture, we see that Yeshua was even described as the first fruits of the Father. He was the very best, the purest product, the purest thing from the Father that the Father could give, which was in fact part of himself. Um, and that's what he gave to his people. But then we run into this thing, and this is kind of tricky, because in the world of giving, there, and I'm firmly convinced in this, having uh, been on the front lines of ministry for most of my life and now leading a congregation. There are people who give and there are people who don't. Um, I don't know how to teach generosity. The people who love generosity and have a heart for it and really understand the Father's heart in it, they love talks like this. They, they understand the value of it. They wish everybody was more generous. The people who don't love to give, the people who are not necessarily as generous um, they've probably already skipped this video. They're done with it. But for our purposes today, I hope that you're on the, on the other side, that you have the heart of the Father, that your, your eye is generous, as Scripture says, and that you're the kind of person who understands that the resources Yahweh gives you as your king, you know, we are his feudal servants in this world. And the resources he gives us are here for us to do his bidding with. They're here for us to advance his kingdom. They're here for us to honor him with. And that's true of every single dime in your pocketbook. That's true of everything, every product that you would increase. If you are a farmer, yes, it's true of your crops. If you have children, it's true of your children. If you, Whatever Yahweh has given you, there is a first fruits of that that is owed back to the kingdom. But one of the areas where people, when you start talking about these things, they make the argument or the excuse, I would say, they say, well, we can't give, we can't tithe, we can't do offerings, we can't do sacrifices because the temple isn't around anymore. I think that's a ridiculous argument. And the reason for it is that we are sitting here keeping Passover. We are sitting here doing all of the feasts of the Lord, for instance. And that's just one example. There's so many other things that we do as acts of worship that were really supposed to be done in the temple with the priesthood. But we don't have a temple and a priesthood. So we still keep Passover anyway to the best that we can. We're not fully keeping Passover. We're not actually eating the Passover lamb as prescribed in Scripture and in the Torah. But we still honor the day. We still embrace the principle. We still try to do as much of it that we can, understanding our own limitations and trusting that the Father will be honored in our feeble attempt. So no, we can't actually give a first fruits offering to the priesthood. And no, we can't technically literally give our tithes and offerings and uh, other things, other acts of generosity directly to the priests as prescribed in the Torah. 
but that's okay. We can still embrace the principle even when the implementation is currently unavailable. If anything else, it is training for us for the kingdom to come. It's us living as though we are in his kingdom now, understanding that his kingdom is partially now, but it will be made more manifest in the years to come. And in all of this, as I read before in Nehemiah, the reason for the tithes and the offerings and the other things, the first fruits that it talks about, is it was in verse 39 where it says, Thus we will not neglect the house of our God. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16 says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple, God will destroy him. For, what t for the temple is holy and that is what you are. Scripture is very, very clear that in the absence of the tabernacle, in the absence of the temple, we have become the temple of God. We collectively, and it's not an individual thing, it's not every person is an individual temple. There's only ever been one temple, and collectively, we make up that temple of God. So, is there a temple today? Absolutely. Is there abominations and sin in our temple? Absolutely. Is there stuff we need to clean up? Absolutely. But together, is there an opportunity for us to serve as priests within that temple, for us to serve God and serve one another within the temple that we all are together? And I think the answer to that is definitively yes. And so as in a lot of things, um, you know, throughout Scripture, a lot of things changed over time. Even Passover changed over time from being a family holiday to a national holiday. And ultimately, even at the crucifixion and the, the Last Supper, if you will, it almost became sort of a global holiday. The doors were open for all people to participate in the redemption that Yeshua has shared. But so things do evolve throughout Scripture. And one of the uh, ways in which this has changed is that the implementation of actually physically taking your first fruits or physically taking your child or whatever to the temple and dedicating it to the Lord, the physical implementation has changed, but the principle still remains. The principles of God's word never change. And so there is still this call, I believe, that all believers have to respond and to answer the obligation that we have to our king to bring forth our first fruits. It is a tribute that we owe him. And if we are his subjects and we don't pay tribute, our citizenship would be in question in any kingdom. I don't think the Father's kingdom is necessarily that much different. And scripture tells us as much that where our treasure is, that's where our heart is. If our heart is in his kingdom, that's where our treasure is going to be. So first fruits, it comes from this Hebrew word, reshith. Um, it essentially means the beginning. Um, it means the first. Um, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with fruits or vegetables, although that can also be part of it. Um, but it really means the beginnings. So when someone has the first fruits of their, of their flock, it means it's the beginning of their flock's growth. When it's the, the reason why we dedicate our children as first fruits, the firstborn, is because we're saying that this is our first child that starts this next generation. And so the Feast of First Fruits, what we're celebrating and what we're here today, it was the start of the barley harvest. And for that matter, it was the entire harvest year. It's important to understand in uh, biblical agriculture, and yes, climates, environments, all this stuff changes over time. Um, the seeds that we have today are not the seeds that they had 2,000 years ago, so I'm not going to get into calendars and timing and all that nonsense. But the Feast of First Fruits was the start of the grain harvest. The grain really being what would sustain the people throughout the years. It would be what they made the bread for in the tabernacle. And, and it started with the barley harvest, and then it culminated in the wheat harvest, essentially 50 days later. But all of these things, these were grains that were harvested that had been planted right after the fall feasts. Um, the season of planting comes in the fall. Um, and then through the winter, it lies dormant. In the springtime, you start to get that first harvest. And so the Feast of First Fruits was the, they would take the very first harvest of that barley. And that's what they would offer to the Lord as a tribute. And so if you think about it from an agricultural perspective, there is no guarantee that when you have your first, that there will be any more. 
And so for an agricultural society to be asked by Yahweh to take the first of what they have, they finally got their hands on the treasure. They finally have a bushel or whatever, a sheaf of barley. And they're being asked by Yahweh to essentially offer it up to him and to destroy it. That is an extraordinary act of faith. Because for all they know, locust storm, hail storm, whatever could have come in the very next day and they would actually starve for the rest of the year. But Yahweh says, and it's similar to what we see with the patriarchs, you know, with the sacrifice of a firstborn son. It's so unthinkable to us. But it's this extraordinary act of faith of saying that, yes, this is what we've been waiting for. This is the promise that you've given us, and we're going to give it back to you. But the unique thing about it is it's called the first fruits. It's called the beginnings. That's literally what the word means. And so we say, Yahweh, these are our beginnings, and we are giving them back to you. And it's not just a spiritual principle. Um, I think spiritual things should always have physical manifestations. We've gotten into this Greek mindset. People love talking about that. But one of the things that the Greeks were famous for was separating body, mind, and spirit. Um, In scripture, and especially in the Hebraic scriptures, you are just who you are. Your body, mind, your spirit, all of those things should be aligned and made manifest holistically. And so all of these things, when we talk about first fruits and we talk about giving the, our beginnings to the Lord, we talk about trusting him for the future, we talk about all these things. Yes, there is this spiritual thing that we can get to through prayer and worship and other things where we should be focused in trusting and, and verbalizing to the Lord how much we trust him. But there is also this call for a physical manifestation of that faith. We have to get to the point where we stop separating the body from the mind and the spirit. We have to be about pursuing total wholeness of being. The word shalom, which everyone probably knows at this point, but shalom comes, it's the concept for peace, it's used as a greeting, but it comes from the root Hebrew word for wholeness. And so true peace, true harmony comes from being whole. It comes from having your body, mind, spirit, your family, your community, your covenants, your relationships, your obligations, your finances, Everything is in absolute alignment and it is whole to the purpose that God has created you for. That's what we're in pursuit of. And so while First Fruits is absolutely a spiritual holiday and there are spiritual things that we can learn from it and there are spiritual things that we can celebrate about it, I think that this should be a concept that is made manifest in our lives, both, of course, on the holiday, the holy day of First Fruits, but it should be throughout every aspect of our lives. Just as we don't live in atonement only on the Day of Atonement, we accept that throughout our entire lives. We don't live in the Feast of Tabernacles or the tabernacling with God, dwelling with him. We don't do that only at the Feast of Tabernacles. We do that in every aspect of our lives. At every moment we dwell with God. At every moment we are atoned. At every moment we are awaiting his return. And at every moment we should be pursuing and pouring out and manifesting a spirit of first fruits toward our King. And so what does that look like? At a minimum, every year, and it actually happens three times a year, it's at every harvest festival, we're called to give our first fruits to God. The holiday, the holy day of first fruits is the grain harvest, because that was essentially the first one that really came in that was um, hugely substantive to the kingdom. But we're supposed to always bring our first fruits to God. It's from the first harvest of the year, and I think for those of us as, you know, <laughs> I grow things occasionally, but not well. I, have a, I collect a paycheck. I've got a day job. I've, uh, the way in which the Lord provides through our family isn't necessarily through fruits and vegetables. It's through my paycheck. And so one of the things that the Father um, convicted me of several years ago is to take that first paycheck of the year. Take that first whatever. However your economy works, take the first, take the best, and dedicate it entirely unto Yahweh. We have to apply it in our physical lives. On every aspect, and it's not just financial. 
We are supposed to dedicate our first child to God. Also, for that matter, it's supposed to be among our children's first days. So when we do that, when, you know, in scripture, they would take them to the tabernacle or the temple and do this dedication ceremony. We don't have that right now, but we can still embrace the principle of it. So what I think we're called to do is we're called to, ta- to take our firstborn children, the first day of our children's lives, dedicate them to the Lord. And in doing so, by saying that this is our first fruits offering to the Lord, we are saying that this is the beginning This is not the end. This is not the midpoint. This is the beginning of a new generation. This is the beginning of this child's life. And not only are we grateful for it and we're thanking the Lord for it, we are dedicating the whole of everything that is to come back to the Lord. When we offer the first fruits of our careers, our projects, our worship, or or whatever, we're making a prophetic statement. We are saying that this is the beginning. And if there's a beginning, that means that there is more to come. I think that's what we're called to. That's what this feast is all about. It's saying this is the beginning. Even when Yeshua was our first fruits, Yeshua, our Messiah, was just the beginning of the salvation and of the kingdom and of so many more things that we still have to look forward to. It was just the start. We have to make those prophetic statements in our lives. We owe it to our children, we owe it to our families, and we owe it to our king. But the question is, do we actually do this? And I think oftentimes, especially here in our westernized society, um, we have a scarcity mindset where we treat everything as though it was our last. So if we were, if we took our mindset and applied it into ancient Israel, we would look at that first harvest of barley and we would say, Uh, we should hang on to this in case we don't get any more. That's the wise thing to do. That's the stewardship thing to do. And that's not what we're called to do. We need to get past this point of where we think of everything as our last. In modern terms, we get our paychecks or whatever. However often you get paid and however that works in your life. We look at our income. And we first evaluate oftentimes, is this going to be enough to make it to the next paycheck? Is this going to be enough to get me through the next whatever? Is this going to be enough to get me to where I want to be financially? And then if there's anything left over, we get to the end of the month, we get to the end of the two-week cycle, we get to the end of the bonus check or whatever, and that's what we use for charity. (laughs) That's what we give to the kingdom of God. That's what we give to people who are ministering. That's what we give to other believers. And it's absolutely twisted. We are called to give our first fruits. So when you get paid, when you have income in your life, when you get your tax return, when you get that stupid stimulus check, when any of that stuff happens, we are called to have that first fruits mindset where we take that and we give it away. We give it back to God and to his kingdom, saying that, yes, Yahweh, it's awesome that I got my first paycheck. I've needed it. Hallelujah. Praise God. But I'm going to give that back as my first fruits because when I give it back, I'm saying that this is just the beginning. And in so doing, we're setting forth this promise in the covenant with our king that this is the start and he will bring us more to come. And it's the same thing with spiritual stuff. It's not all just money, even though here in the West, that's all we tend to worry about. But even with our worship or our Sabbath keeping and other things like that, oftentimes we get to the point where we get to the end of the week and if we have enough energy, if we aren't burnt out, if we had a good week and our kids didn't stress us out, then we will go to church. Then we will go to our synagogue. Then we'll go to our congregation. And if we have enough energy and if we feel good and if we don't have a headache and if we're not hungry, then we will stand and sing and worship the Lord. All of that is the exact opposite of what we should be giving to the Lord. We're not supposed to give him what we have left. We're supposed to give him what we have first, our first and our best. And that's something that we have to get our heads wrapped around, even just in our congregational worship. If you find yourself in the pattern where you don't have the energy to properly keep a Sabbath assembly or to participate in it, you need to change the rest of your week. I don't know how to say it any plainer than that. 
our obligation, our first and foremost, is to get together with other priests in God's kingdom, to have a holy convocation, and to worship the Lord. If anything is standing in the way of that, then you're not giving him your first and your best. You're giving him whatever's left over if there's anything left over. You're giving him a Cain-type offering. And we're called to give our first and our best. We have to get to the point where we approach our week, where we structure our lives around saying, I'm going to give the Lord my life. Worship is a high priority, perhaps the highest priority in my life. And I will invest the best of my time, the best of my energy, the best of my resources, the best of my focus, the best of my concentration on those acts of worship and prayer and relationship with the Father. And if there's anything left over, I'll give it to my employer. <laughs> if there's anything left over, I'll give it to my neighborhood or my friends or other people. But first and foremost, we prioritize our first fruits of all that we are to the Lord. And when you do that, it changes absolutely everything. So Job and a few other scriptures talk about this idea of first fruits. And it's always, if you put these in context and understand what these people went through, so what Job went through, Job 42 verse 12 says, Yahweh blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, more than his first fruits. So he had a great life to begin with. Um, that was taken from him. Um, essentially, he gave it to the Lord. <laughs> um, and from that, he got even more. Proverbs 11 verse 25 says, The generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters himself will be watered. When we give our first and best to the kingdom, we are promised a blessing. When we say, when we make that statement um, of our citizenship under his sovereign kingdom, he is a good king and he will see that we are taken care of. He will be our provider. He will sustain us. He will keep us safe. Our part in the agreement is to uphold that tribute, to uphold the obedience of his ways, to honor our king in everything that we do. And even with this, we talk a lot about holiness in this movement. Uh, this whole idea of something being kadosh or holy means that it's set apart. And that really is all that it means. It means that something is set apart for God. It's not a magic formula that makes something holy. It's just saying, I'm going to take a piece of what I have, and this piece, this set-apart piece, is holy for God. So whether it's your tithe, your offerings, your first fruits, a certain amount of time in your life, your energy, your resources, whatever it is, when you take it and consciously, purposefully, deliberately set it apart, you can make that holy and give it to the Father. All of this applies in our spiritual lives too. Proverbs 1 verse 7 says, The fear of Yahweh is the beginning or the first fruits of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Psalm 111 verse 9 says, He has sent redemption to his people. He has ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning or the first fruits of wisdom. His a good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Yeshua was the first fruits. He was the beginning of the promise that we have to overcome the grave. He was, you know, fully God, but also fully man. And in the fact that he overcame the grave, it was the first, it was the promise of the beginning of the fact that death has no sting, that we too will receive eternal life, that he has taken captivity captive, and we have nothing to fear. Revelation 22 verse 13, he says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning, or the first fruits and the end. In scripture, it says, in the beginning, in the first fruits, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, the first fruits. In the beginning, Yeshua created the heavens and the earth. Revelation 13 verse 8 talks about how he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Yeshua was the beginning. He will always be the beginning. He's the promise that there is more to come. And even in scripture, we, we love these verses, but it says in Isaiah 46, declaring the end from the beginning, 
So declaring the, if the beginning is the first fruits, if the beginning is Yeshua, he's declaring the end from the first fruits from Yeshua and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish my good pleasure. He declares the end from Yeshua. Yeshua is our first fruits. He is where we begin. He is the promise of what we have to come. And in all of these things, we live out a small, small portion of what he is by emulating it in our lives as his disciples. We step forward and say, just as you gave your life as a first fruits, we too are going to give our lives as the first fruits. We are going to serve as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation in this world. We are going to minister to one another. We are going to pour out everything we have, understanding that that statement, that giving of the first and the best, back to God and back to his kingdom is a promise that this is just the beginning. When you give, it is a statement that this is just the beginning. And I have seen countless times in my life, people who have given in those extraordinary acts. Sometimes they give it all. Sometimes they give a portion, whatever they feel the father has laid on their heart for, depending on whether it's a tithe or an offering or whatever. The Father always responds by fulfilling his role as our king, as our provider. And as much as we trust on that for our spiritual lives, for our eternal life, for our eternal salvation, my hope and prayer is that we would see it here and now, that we would understand that the first fruits and the sovereignty of our king exists now. Our obligation as citizens of his kingdom begins now. We will give him the first fruits of all that we are, knowing that he will respond to what we have as our beginnings. And ultimately, he will build an eternal life for each and every one of us. So I thank you for this season. I thank you for this time. I thank you for listening. Um, I hope if you're ever in Nashville, you'll come check us out at Mercy Collective. Um, it is an absolutely extraordinary time to be alive. And I'm so excited to get to share this season with you. Shalom.